February 22nd, 1935, Max Gordon opens up a club on 7th Avenue in New York called the Village Vanguard. Since 1957, over 100 jazz albums have been recorded at the venue, starting off with the great Sonny Rollins. Max Gordon ran the club until his death in 1989. His wife took over, and she still runs the club today. On November 3rd, 2011, Lorraine Gordon called in and left us a message with a uh, special uh, story, a few little details about her life that she wanted to share. So here's Lorraine's phone message. Hello, I'm Lorraine Gordon, and I'm calling from the Village Vanguard in New York City. And uh, I'm sure it's well-known as is now 76 years old in the same location. Max Gordon opened it in 1934. My husband was 35, so that makes it 76 years old. And unfortunately, he left us, but he left it in my hands, and so I do keep it running, and I'm very proud of it. And everybody else loves it, and they come from all over the world. So um, it's a very happy experience for me to book it and to run it and to take good care of it. But I've had a long life in jazz, and uh, I have to say my first husband was Blue Note Records, Alfred Lyon, and through him I had the good fortune of meeting Thelonious Monk. And because of that, we did the first great recordings of Thelonious on Blue Note Records. And he was not even known then. Well, today he's known as the great genius I always knew he was. And he did play here, as I booked him here, many, many years ago. However, that's just a little chapter in my life, and the main part is the Vanguard, which is hale and hearty and wonderful and has great talent. And people come from all over the world, and I love taking care of it, and I work sometimes morning, noon, and night, a few shifts. But uh, it deserves a lot of care because we want it to stay here forever. And it's been a pleasure talking to you all. And whenever you are in New York, do come on down. Those 15 stairs are down and 15 stairs going up. But it's good exercise. So come. And we look forward to seeing everybody at this illustrious club. Bye now. I'm Roswell Rudd, trombonist, composer, living in New York City and also upstate in Cahonson, New York. I'd like to go back to 1960 to 1963 um, and tell a little story about friend and teacher and genius, uh, Herbie Nichols. I'm telling this particular story about Herbie Nichols because I don't think it's been documented and I prefer not to rehash stuff about his life that's already been published. So, Herbie Nichols. To get an idea about how delving and how creative this man was at the same time, you only have to listen to whatever recordings there are. All of Herbie's tunes are programmatic. That is, they are inspired by specific people and situations. You want jazz stories, so check out any of these tunes. Now, here's the recurrent basic scenario that runs through it all as observed live by myself back in the day. It happened various times, usually out on the street, on a break. Herbie loved conversation, and when there wasn't any, he would be trying to get one going. His typical technique was to throw out something mildly provocative, just testing the waters, for the sake of stimulating a response 
from someone who happened to be standing by. As the dialogue would grow more intense, hopefully a third person would enter the foray. The mood could range anywhere, but the main thing was that three voices were now involved. And this was the provocateur's cue to step back from the discussion in order to play closer attention to the exchanges stemming from what he had initiated. You hear a lot of beautiful call response in Herbie's music. Just wanted you to know where a lot of it came from. And in these discussions, it would even get to a point where he'd pull out what he called his goof sheet, his notebook, and be actually writing down what he was witnessing and be heaving with that deep, sob-like laughter of his. That's the story. Hi, my name is Annie Ross, and I'm a singer, and a performer, and an actress, and a cookbook author, and a lyricist, and uh, I just want to tell you about a story concerning Sarah Vaughan. When John Hendricks and Dave Lambert, when we were Lambert, Hendricks, and Ross, we played a gig at the Apollo Theater. And we had played there many times, and we always stopped the show because we started there, and the public took us as one of their own. And so we were appearing with people like Red Fox, Moms Mabley, the Basie Band, the Ellington Band. It was fantastic. So I get there the first day, and I go up to my dressing room. And as you can imagine, to be on the same bill with Sarah Vaughan was fantastic. And I was in my dressing room. They were very funny dressing rooms because at that time they were all um, lined with linoleum. And you always knew to take a can of roach spray when you went to the Apollo. And so you would spray the dressing room to keep the roaches out. They would go next door. The people next door would spray. They'd come back. So this game went on and on. So in the middle of all this, there's a knock on the door, and in walks Sarah. And she said, Annie. I said, what? And it was one of the great moments of my life. She said, teach me doodling. Well, for me to teach Sarah Vaughan, one of my songs and solos was beyond my wildest dreams. Told me he dug her, got me to do loom so he could bug her. When he put his arms around her, quite to his surprise, oh, 